Hi, thanks for joining us today. In a couple weeks, on Sunday, February 7th, we'll worship outside again together. We'll have communion that day, and you can join on your lawn chairs or from the comfort of your car. Either way, we'll pay very careful attention to safety protocols. After worship, we'll hold the annual meeting of the congregation. There are some joyful things that we want to celebrate and some items of business that we must do together in person. We'll give you an update on the life and health of the church. The congregation will vote on the pastor's compensation package and will elect church officers who've been serving for some months now. And we'll amend the bylaws of the congregation to allow for electronic meetings. I told you it would be exciting. We'll make sure that the information we present that day is available to everyone, both online and in person. And we're working on ideas to help encourage conversation between the congregation and church leadership, even though we can't all be together in the same room. A little bit after that, on Monday, February 15th, we're hosting a Red Cross blood drive in the afternoon and evening. Red Cross does a wonderful job of making sure that's safe for everyone involved, and all donations are tested for COVID antibodies. Please register online. That will help us control the flow of people. You can find a link in either the January or February grapevine or contact the church office. Our church is also hosting outdoor yoga for teens in the community. It's a chance for kids to get together in person to move and breathe and relax. And the Red Cross Blood Drive and Yoga for Teens is just a few of the ways that we offer the hospitality of our campus to groups outside the church whose mission aligns with ours. We've found some wonderful partnerships through that, and we're glad to be able to offer it. Speaking of our youth, our youth are joining kids from several churches around the presbytery for an online Bible study on Monday evenings. Each night, the kids watch a brief animated video that gives an overview of one book of the Bible, and then they talk about it. And their conversations have been super fun and engaging. If you'd like more information about any of these programs, please contact the church office, and we'll be sure to get you connected. And now, settle your hearts into worship as Donna leads us in a time of confession. Trusting in God's promise of grace, let us confess our sin. Forgiving God, we repent all the ways we turn from you. You call, but we do not listen. You show us paths of righteousness, but we do not follow. We distract ourselves from your call with busyness, stress, and worry. We tangle ourselves in webs of hostility that disguises itself as fear. Forgive us, O oh Lord, and by your forgiveness, open our ears to hear your voice saying to us, follow me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven, and you are given new life. Good morning, children of God. In our Bible story today, Jesus was walking around Galilee, calling people to come and follow him. The people he called in this story were fishermen. They caught fish for a living. But Jesus wanted them to come and catch people for God. I doubt that Simon, Andrew, James, or John had any training in telling people about God. We don't even really know if they knew Jesus that well or even had heard of him. They didn't really know where Jesus was going, but they sensed that Jesus was safe and loved all people. They were caught by Jesus's love for us all. And so they followed knowing that somehow it would be okay. We too are caught in Jesus's love. Love is what causes people to follow Jesus. And Jesus calls us all to share God's love wherever we are and wherever we go. No special training needed. So go out and share how God has worked in your life. And all God's children say, Amen.
Listen to God's word to you from the Gospel of Mark. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending the nets. Immediately he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please bow your heads with me. Loving Lord God, may we never take up your word without taking in your word. So in these next moments, speak your word to us that we may hear Jesus call to repent and believe and follow him. Amen. It helps a little if you imagine the story Donna just read for us beginning as just another day in Galilee. It was and still is a small town. Everyone knew everybody. The family you bought your fish from in the market sat just behind you each week in the synagogue for worship. And the teacher who opened the scriptures in new ways was the guy who built the boat the fishers just added to their little fleet. That day started out just like any other day, but then suddenly it wasn't. There was something different in Jesus' eyes, some new sense of purpose in the way he walked. Maybe it was that after 30 or so years of preparing and maturing, he felt ready. It might have also had something to do with the fact that he had just received word that his cousin, John, had been arrested by King Herod, and he had had enough. It was time to get to work, time to move from preparation to action, time to bring people together into a ministry that was about proclaiming repentance and good news, time to stop hoping for change and start striving for it, time to discover if this message of hope can actually change the world and bring people together. So when Jesus strode up that day to two sets of brothers working on their boats and said, it's time, the kingdom of God has drawn near. Repent and believe this good news. It wasn't the first time they'd ever met him. This wasn't the call of some charismatic stranger. They were hearing a familiar preacher, perhaps even a friend, telling them that the time for a new direction, a new intensity had arrived. And something clicked in them. The passion that had been planted in them, something that had been growing in them as they worked and spent time with their families and saw that the world wasn't the way it was supposed to be, that passion ignited and a fire started to burn. It was time to follow Jesus. It was partly because of the power of who he was, but it was also because of the beauty of what he was calling them into. They'd never heard anyone else talk about the kingdom of God, but Jesus talked about it all the time. He developed the idea as they traveled from town to town and Jesus taught the crowds. The kingdom of God isn't a place, some idyllic other world we go to after we die where every home is a glittering palace and the streets are paved with gold. 
Instead, the kingdom of God is the mystery by which the power of God works through ordinary people to form this world into what God always intended it to be. It is a mystery, something that has already begun but not yet been completed. That must be why when Jesus spoke about it, he usually used parables. It's like seed scattered on the ground. It grows, but when the time is right, there is an abundant harvest. It's like a mustard seed. It grows into a shrub that is scrubby and tough, not at all glorious or majestic or beautiful. But when it's grown, it provides a home for everyone. It's hard for those who love their wealth to enter into this kingdom work, but those who have loving God and loving others as their top priority, oh, they're right in the thick of it. The kingdom of God is the idea that God's power works in and through those who commit themselves to follow Jesus, to transform what is wrong and broken, wounded, and sick in this world into righteousness, justice, wholeness, and peace, and reconciliation. Oh, God, I want the world to be that way. Don't you think that's worth investing yourself in? Simon and Andrew, James and John seemed to think it was. So they followed Jesus. Following Jesus into this kingdom life meant that they would have to leave some things behind. Not their nets, not entirely at least. Scripture tells us that they continued their livelihood as fishermen. Now they just thought of it as a side hustle. Following Jesus was their true purpose in life. Often we think of that kind of commitment to Christ as something we should leave to the professionals. A few Christians are called to dedicate their whole lives to Christ, and we pay them to run the church for us. If Jesus wanted the kingdom to come that way, he would have called 12 rabbis, but he didn't. He called ordinary people people who came from all different walks of life. Following Jesus will always call for some repenting in us. All of us have to leave something behind because if we're going to go his way, that means we must change direction from our own way. I'm sorry to be the one to say it out loud, you are a good person. I love you, but you are not without sin. <laughs> Lord knows I'm not either. Jesus calls us to repent and believe the good news. And that means that we have to wake up to the painful realization that there is sin in our lives. We need to acknowledge it and acknowledge the damage it does in our own hearts and to the people we're in relationship with. That is hard work. It hurts, but it is necessary because it frees us to follow Jesus and to work for God's kingdom purposes. Jesus said that it was time, time to repent and believe and follow. Maybe you've heard people in the church talk about the difference between chronos time, like chronological order, and kairos time, God's time. One moment that makes a difference for the whole rest of your life, past, present, and future. We can see the difference between these two kinds of time in our ordinary lives, as well as in our lives of faith. 
Think of a couple who've been married for more than 50 years. Kronos time is the day on the calendar when they had their first date and the day when he proposed. Kronos time is their wedding anniversary that they celebrate every year. But Kairos time is the moment when they realized they were in love. And that moment might have come on a different day for him than it did for her. The life they built together, living into that life-changing Kairos moment is peppered with a few times of heroic faithfulness, but it is built on ordinary acts of commitment. It's walking together through a life-threatening illness, toughing it out through a season of unemployment. But it also means cooking dinner and taking out the trash, saying, I'm sorry, and I was wrong. It's the same for the commitment of love we've made to Jesus Christ. There was a moment when we promised ourselves when we were captured by his love and his purposes, enough to make solemn vows to follow Christ. But to live out of that Kairos moment means dedicating the ordinariness of our lives to his service. Our lives are built on thousands of ordinary days that are just like any other day. But the foundation we build our lives on is made from just a few days. Days that make a difference in all the rest. Follow me, Jesus said. It's that simple and it's that difficult. That's why we're invited into the life of faith. That's what we're invited into. And it's a life we can invite others into as well. The mysterious power of God working in us and through us to provide for the world what it so desperately needs in this moment, in this time. Sometimes that happens in big ways, with big commitments and grand gestures. Most of the time, it happens in quiet deeds of generosity, in dedicating ourselves to one particular project and seeing it through to the end, in respectful conversation, in forgiving past wounds and committing to the good for other people. Think of all the people who are waiting for the good news that the world can and will turn. We have been given that good news and God has given it to us to share with the world. Will you follow where Jesus is leading you? It's time. Giselle Ayon has offered her gifts with us for several times now. You got to see her just a few weeks ago in our Epiphany service. We first met her a couple years ago, and she's joined us for Easter Sundays and Christmas concerts. She's even shared a video she created with um, our choir for their Zoom party this summer. She's completed the theater program at Cal State Long Beach and dreams to work on Broadway one day. You can lift her up in your prayers. She's moving this week to Utah for seven months where she's found an opportunity to do some theater work. The song she's singing for us today beautifully captures the humble spirit of one who promises to follow Jesus.
Go in peace to love and serve the world. And as you go, may the gifts of the Holy Spirit be yours. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be yours, and may the blessing of God Almighty be yours, now and forever. Amen. Today we close our service with Janet playing an arrangement of Amazing Grace. As you listen, pray that God would use you to bring healing, restoration, righteousness, and grace to the world that God loves. <laughs>